loneliness. There are plenty of words to describe the feeling of it. Empty, forlorn, isolated. I guess, uh, I guess depression would sort of be on the same level as loneliness. Pull in and, and not want to share those feelings. A lot of people feel lonely. You can be lonely even when you're surrounded by people. Feeling a disconnect from others, a gap between what we are faced with and the interactions we long for. It's something we've all experienced in one way or another. And yet, loneliness finds a way to make us feel, well, alone. That loneliness and that isolation really causes like a disconnect. The world is so big and scary, the world changes so quickly, and people kind of just get lost in the chaos. It's a busy time of year, holidays and festivities, packed schedules, a new year just days away, and with it, a solemn anniversary lurks. Soon enough, it'll be four years since the world was stopped in its tracks and everything changed. Tonight, the nation and the world continue to reel under the onslaught of the pandemic. This country, this generation, is being put to a test. There are now more than 100,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus here in the U.S. The feelings of isolation throughout the pandemic. The impact of socialization from COVID. During COVID, they were really experiencing, of course, the physical isolation. The COVID pandemic, oh my God. COVID-19. Where there was talk of loneliness and isolation, the pandemic, too, crept its way into the conversation. I believe that that period of COVID um, created a lot of isolation. And right now, we're looking more carefully at the repercussions, and people are aware of it. That's Vicki Zimmon. She's the call center manager of Framingham's Call to Talk office, located within United Way of Tri-County right here in downtown Framingham. Call to Talk is a 24-7, 365 days a year confidential hotline where people can call for mental health and emotional support. It's a tight-knit group of people who keep this operation going, and they are ready to provide compassionate listening to anyone who calls. That's okay. <laughs> You can Program manager Maggie McNeil says receiving calls from people experiencing loneliness is nothing new. But during and after the pandemic, she did notice a shift in who was calling. In terms of the loneliness category, there might be people who maybe weren't reaching out and feeling that way before. So, for example, we saw a lot of um, younger folks reaching out who, you know, maybe were in that high school, college age where everything went virtual and they weren't able to see their friends, right? Or it was their first year of college and they came home about halfway through, even the middle school age. Data released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2020, from March to October, when the pandemic was in full swing, found that mental health-related emergency department visits, including suicide-related issues, increased by 24 percent for children 5 to 11 years old and 31 percent for those 12 to 17, when compared to 2019. CDC analysis in 2022 noted more than a third, that's 37 percent of high school students, reported they experienced poor mental health during the pandemic. 44 percent reported they felt persistently sad or hopeless. The pandemic has certainly exacerbated these challenges, but they're not necessarily new. The CDC's Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System found that in the 10 years leading up to the pandemic, there was about a 40 percent increase in feelings of persistent sadness and hopelessness and or suicidal thoughts and behaviors among youth. It's an important distinction to make that these mental health crises so tightly bound to loneliness and feelings of isolation existed long before the pandemic because it may have an impact on how we deal with it and how we talk about it. The physical isolation made it okay to say, I'm lonely. But now that we're not as physically isolated, we're embarrassed that we're still emotionally feeling alone. This epidemic was going on before the, the other epidemic, the big epidemic, right? The loneliness epidemic was happening. It got some attention during the COVID pandemic because it was so in your face and because it was happening to everyone. And then, it's my perception that 
as we want to get back to normal, whatever that means, we kind of want to pretend that we're not lonely anymore. And so the attention it was getting is maybe fading again. But I think it's probably been here pretty steadily the whole time, and sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. Back in September of this year, the frame spoke in depth with Rabbi Allison Poirier of Temple Beth Shalom. Her temple and many other faith-based groups started a listening session to discuss loneliness in the hopes that starting a conversation would make people feel less alone. Children and teens have been on her radar. I haven't met a teenager who's okay right now. They seem really stressed, really anxious, and, and kind of maybe don't have the resources to deal with that, being young people. And also maybe this is a new demographic that's affected, so we might not know how to help that demographic. Allison says their series was inspired by the United States Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy's advisory, released in early May of this year, which called loneliness and isolation an epidemic. Social connection is as fundamental to our mental and physical health as food, water, and sleep. And it affects our performance and productivity at work, school, and in our communities. The Surgeon General goes on to say that loneliness and isolation are associated with a greater risk of numerous mental and physical health challenges, from heart disease and dementia to depression and anxiety. Navigating the unparalleled nature of this crisis often comes with more questions than answers. At least that's the case for Katie Roy, Vice President of Programming for Big Brothers Big Sisters, a mentorship organization that serves the greater Metro West area. I think the one thing we heard throughout the entire pandemic was that it was unprecedented, right? And um, because of that, we won't know the social impact of um, kids being isolated, which of course was completely necessary, but we won't know the social implications of that probably until these kids are grown up. Big Brothers Big Sisters mentors kids as young as eight years old, all the way up to 25 years old. Katie says she's noticed a lot of changes in her kids across the board the past few years. Kids have a lot of anxiety about being around people. And um, it's, it's not, you know, so much for the virus, it's that they're, it's kind of become a little bit um, different for them. And it's something that they're not used to sort of managing. And so we have kids who have really post COVID developed a lot of social anxiety, a lot of um, struggles around how do I make friends? How do I insert myself in a group of people and become accepted and open to meeting new people? That's something Michael Anastasi, a student at Framingham Public Schools can relate to. Mikey was getting into the groove of high school when classes stopped and switched to virtual learning. It was really shocking to hear uh, at first um, because the isolation and that I didn't, I wasn't able to spend time with friends as much as I used to. It was honestly kind of a difficult one. It wasn't until his junior year that Mikey and his classmates were able to return back to a sense of normalcy. Mikey shared with me that it's always been a struggle for him to make friends, even before the pandemic. He's been diagnosed with autism and ADHD, which can make socializing a challenge. Adding COVID into the mix has made it a tough few years. Yeah, it definitely felt really weird going back outside after like months of isolation. Has it made socializing kind of more challenging because of that, you think? For me, yeah, because I haven't talked to a lot of people in I haven't talked to my close friends in a while since the pandemic happened. Um, luckily, that has changed, but it honestly felt a more awkward for me. And it wasn't just friendships that were impacted. Entire milestones, like homecomings, proms, and graduations. You know, we all made it work, but you look at the people who came before you and think, oh wow, they had a normal college experience. They were able to graduate from either college or high school. They were able to have dances. They were able to kind of get along with other students and be with them and not worry about getting someone's grandma sick. The start of 2020 was an exciting time for Holly. She had just transferred to Worcester State as a sophomore to be closer to home. She was making new friends. Things were looking up, she said until devastating March 2020 came and after that it kind of felt like marbles down a stairs down the stairs kind of um, trickling effect of you know what happens when you have to stay home and you can't really see your friends face to face or even your teachers. Holly recently graduated from Worcester State and now works with students here at Framingham High School. She worries about her students 
and kids even younger. You know, we've had prior years of normalcy, but when COVID hit for those age groups, um, there's a lot that was missed out on how to socialize and how to kind of be a human being and how to act, what's normal, what's not. Holly admitted she relates to that too, even now as a young professional. Some people making friends comes easily to them. They're able to spark up a conversation with anybody, but other people it kind of takes a lot of time and it's a skill you have to build. Um, and staying inside for so long and being isolated definitely impacted the ability to build that skill. A national epidemic that's ravaging rather quietly. So what do we do? A good start could be to make some noise, acknowledge loneliness, and talk about it. People can feel that, you know, there are problems, but, you know, maybe you can only hope that if that awareness is there and people are talking about it, that, you know, people start to connect again a little bit more. I mean, there's just going to be more of a call for services, like serious services on a state level, on a national level. Services like Call to Talk, they want to hear from you and they're ready to listen. We can't underscore this enough, like the power, the absolute power of listening and being non-judgmental and giving someone that place where they get to tell their story, right? They get to be heard and validated and supported. Just the idea that someone, a stranger who doesn't know you is picking up the phone and they genuinely care. You know, we, we genuinely care. We want that person to feel heard and supported. Um, you know, I think that alone can be really powerful, especially if it's someone who's, you know, maybe feel, experiencing feelings of loneliness or burdensomeness or hopelessness. Just knowing that a complete stranger out there really does care. What would you say to someone who's maybe experiencing, you know, loneliness or, or feeling isolated? What would you want them to kind of know? Well, as cheesy as it sounds, um, I would want them to know they're not alone in feeling that way. I would let them know that they're not they're not the only one going through it. We're not in this alone. Everybody has experienced loneliness, and so you don't have to make yourself more alone. And if we've all experienced it, then we all have that empathy ready to go for somebody. If we can kind of get it out there and talk about it and talk it through.